good morning, good morning. My name is Will Bray. I'm the campus pastor at Upstate Church Anderson. Man, I'm just so excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, I love the more so much. I love getting to work with Ashley and I'm thankful for his leadership here at Upstate Church Baldwin across our church. Uh, I know that you guys are thankful for him and his family as well. And um, man, I, I'm just so excited to jump into God's word this morning. Uh, I, I know most of you probably know this, but we planted uh, the Anderson campus and the Malden campus literally like on the same day, like at the same time. So there's like, we got a little connection, you know what I'm saying? So I love being at Malden. Um, we're in here for like a year together and I'm just, uh, man, I'm, I'm so thankful to be a part of this and excited to see what God's going to do this morning. If you've been here the last few weeks, uh, then you know we've been in a series just a few weeks on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, two weeks ago, we asked the question, what would happen if we gave God all of our time? What would it look like if we, as followers of Jesus, gave God all of our time and all of our energy? Then last week, we talked about giving God our talent, our, our gifts, saying, God, use me. What if we gave God all of our talents? And then this week, we're going to answer the question, what would happen if we gave God our treasure? If we think about the things that matter most to us, our possessions, our money, the things that we have gathered and accumulated for ourselves, number one, what would happen if we gave God those things, if we, if we invested those things in the kingdom of God? And then what we'll try to do, if that's our goal, if that's what God's called us into, then how can we live with that kind of mindset? How can we live as Christians with an investor mindset? with our money and with our possessions and with that which God has given us. That's our goal this morning. And so we're going to jump into Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We'll begin in just a moment in verse 10. The book of Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom, but it can also be pretty depressing at times. All right, if you've ever read it before, it's kind of like there are some things in Ecclesiastes where it's like, this is not good news. Like, if you've ever read Proverbs, it's kind of on the positive side, happy stuff for the most stuff. Ecclesiastes is like, yeah, nothing matters, like at all. You're like, really? He's like, nah, not anything. Like, it's tough. So, like, there are some things in the passage that we're going to read that really do come from a wisdom perspective. It's trying to teach us how can we live a godly life in reference to our money and our, and our possessions. There are going to be some things in this passage of scripture where it's like, dang, this is kind of not great news. Like, this is, this is kind of tough. This is hard to hear. So we'll get a little bit of both when it comes to our treasure as we read through Ecclesiastes 5 this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and, like, address something. I know I'm 24 years old. You're like, he doesn't even have any money. You're right. I don't. All right? Like, that's true. All right? So what I'm going to do is not going to... I'm not going to try to give you any financial tips. Wally Harris is here. That's what he's here for. All right. You can ask him for financial tips. He can do that. All right. I can't. All right. I'm, I'm no help there. But what I do believe is that God's word has something to say to us when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our treasure, our possessions. I believe that God's word is true, that we can build our lives on it. So I'm not going to try to give any financial advice. I'm not, I'm not going to try to give you my own experience. I just want us to open up God's God's word together, see what it says, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit, we just ask God, would you help us to build our lives on that? That's our goal this morning. So Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 10. It says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. It is useless. It's purposeless. Verse 11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And he, as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? 
Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness with much vexation and sickness and anger. That's the part I was saying is a little tough, all right? That's, that's tough to hear, verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Three truths I want us to see this morning when it comes to our treasure. When it comes to our wealth, our possessions, our money, the first truth I want you to see this morning is that you will never have enough to satisfy. You will never have enough to satisfy. This is unbelievably clear from our text this morning. It's really not difficult. I don't really have to give much explanation. Verse 10 says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. That's pretty clear. Like, that's not confusing. There's not a lot of caveats there. It's clear. If you make money the love of your life, if you give your heart to the money you could attain or the possessions you could consume or the things that you could gather for yourself, Ecclesiastes tells us that we will not find satisfaction in those things. A love for possessions will ultimately ensure that you feel that you never have enough. If our desire is to accumulate and gather for ourselves, then we will always feel like we need to accumulate and gather more. We'll never be satisfied with what we have. The key word, I think, in this verse is the word love. Uh, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. There's a really common misconception. A lot of people think that Jesus said that money is the root of evil. And that's actually not true. Number one, the verse they get that from is actually in 1 Timothy. So it's actually Paul who said it. And it doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says that a love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The point is this. Being wealthy, having, having money, having possessions, it's not evil or wrong or sinful in and of itself. You may say, well, I'm not wealthy. It doesn't even matter. When we talk about the grand scheme of the world in which we live in, everyone in this room is wealthy. When, when we think about what people across the world have, we have more than we need. If you think about historical standards, you think about the people that Paul was writing to in 1 Timothy when he writes that, we think about the people who are the audience of the book of Ecclesiastes, the kind of wealth that we have far surpasses anything they could have ever imagined, even those of us who don't have all that much in modern standards. So we are all well off in this context. We all have more than we, the grand majority of us have more than we need. And so we all have to consider how do we use that for God's glory? It's not wrong in and of itself that you have money. It's not wrong in and of itself that we have possessions, But the Bible says we're wrong when we make that the object of our heart. When we make our treasure the object of our affection, when we give our love away to that which we can consume, to that which can entertain us, to that which we can gather and accumulate for ourselves. He says the sin is when we actually give our hearts away to our money. You may say, why is that the case? Why is that true? Why why is that sinful? And, and kind of how can we work through that? How can we actually choose Jesus over that? When I think about this choice that we make, my mind always goes to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. And it'll be on the screen. So if you're taking notes, I just jot that verse down. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says this. God says, my people have committed two evils. God, God gives us what John Piper calls the essence of evil. He gets down to the bottom of our sin. Something like what Paul said when he says that the root of all kinds of evil is a love for money. It's very similar. Paul said, or the, God says in Jeremiah that at the bottom of our sin is this. My people have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug out cisterns for themselves that can hold no water at all. 
Uh, if you're not familiar, a cistern, especially in the time of the writing of the book of Jeremiah, was generally a well-like structure they would use. They would dig into the ground, run off rainwater, would go into this hole in the ground. They would line it with clay so that the water would actually hold. And what would happen over time is that the clay would begin to break and crack and it would hold no water at all. And this is exactly the picture that God has in his mind, the picture he's trying to show us. He says, sin, the bottom of our sin, in our context this morning, especially when it comes to our money and our possessions, is this. First of all, we have abandoned the fountain of living water. God claims to be for us an unending source of satisfaction and fulfillment. This is what Jesus says to the woman at the well when he says that he can give her something to drink, that she would never need to be thirsty again if she would just drink of that well. Jesus claims to be for us an unending satisfaction and fulfillment. And, and the, the, the rub for us, the problem for us, the intersection for us is that we have not only abandoned the only source of unending satisfaction and fulfillment that exists in this life, but we have tried to dig wells for ourselves, hoping just to catch some satisfaction from the other parts in our lives. And God says the problem with that is that they hold no water at all. The truth is, is that you've experienced this in your life. Maybe in the context of our time this morning, maybe you've experienced it with money. Maybe you know, man, I've tried. I've tried to find satisfaction and fulfillment by gaining enough money. I thought that if I could be, get rich enough, if I could have enough money in my savings account, if I could invest enough in my 401k, I thought that if I had enough, then I would be happy. And God says that's like digging holes in the desert, hoping they'll catch some water, but it's a broken well. It's a broken cistern. It can hold no water at all. Maybe you've experienced this with other things in your life. Maybe it's possessions for you. It's how nice your house is or how nice your car is, how fast your boat can go. Maybe for you, it's the comforts of this life, the vacation you'd go on, the, the restaurants you go out to, the food that you'd eat. You say, maybe that's kind of where you're using it. That's what you look to for satisfaction. No matter where you're looking for satisfaction in this life, no matter where you're looking for joy, for happiness, for fulfillment, if you abandon the fountain of living water, then every other well will run dry. Every other thing you could look to for satisfaction, it might satisfy for a moment, it might quench your thirst for a time, but it will always end up dry in the end. And so when in, con in the context of our time together this morning, when we look at our money and our treasures, our possessions, the book of Ecclesiastes says you should not make a love for money the object of your heart because you'll never be satisfied there. You can only be satisfied in Jesus. And I love the way that C.S. Lewis says it. I think he helps explain why. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We are like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You were created to enjoy God. You were created to know him, to live in relationship with him, to be satisfied in him, and your soul will not be content with anything else. So it doesn't matter how much money you make, your soul won't be content in money. It doesn't matter how big your house is, your soul won't be content in a home. It doesn't matter how nice your car is, how big your boat is, how many nice vacations you go on, how much you can gather for yourself. It, you, it will never be enough because your soul was not made to find its satisfaction and fulfillment in things. You're created for more than that. You were meant for more than that. Your soul won't be satisfied in lesser things. And so this morning, we've got to decide, will I miss out on the true joy and satisfaction of fulfillment that God wants to give me in himself, or will I be satisfied with lesser things? 
Will I just be okay with not getting everything that God has for me? If we invest our lives in what we can gain for ourselves, our own money, possessions, our own fulfillment, then we'll always come up empty. They'll always be broken cisterns. Or we can invest our lives in the only things that matter for all of eternity. So the first truth about our treasure this morning is that you will never have enough to satisfy. The second truth about our material possessions and our money this morning is this. You can't take it with you when you go. You can't take it with you when you go. Pick back up with me starting in verse 13 in Ecclesiastes 5. Verse 13 says, There's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's a way in which you can actually gather possessions to yourself that is to your own detriment, that actually hurts you. Verse 14, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And you guys know this is true. We've all experienced this. If you haven't experienced it in your own life, you know someone who has. The book of Ecclesiastes says you can gather all that you want to, but you cannot guarantee you're going to be able to keep it. There's no amount of money that can provide the security that is, absolute, that is absolute, that's ultimate. There's no amount of money that can ensure you'll always have it. It can be lost in a bad venture, Ecclesiastes says. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. If we do not believe in eternity, if we do not believe that our treasure is in heaven, if we do not believe in life after this, then that sentence is depressing. If we do not believe that Jesus is coming again, then that's the worst news ever, that all of your work is in vain, that all you can accumulate for yourself is meaningless. That's terrible news if Jesus isn't coming again. It's terrible news if there's no life after this, but there is life after this. Jesus is coming again. And so there's actually something worth investing our lives in. There's something worth giving up everything for, but it's not our money, it's not our possessions, it's not our treasure. Instead, it's the kingdom of God. He says that you cannot take it with you when you go. I I love that the Bible speaks about this in a very poetic way, right? Just as he came into the world, so will he go. But honestly, I'm just a simple man. I'm a country boy. I've always lived in Georgia and South Carolina. So I was like, there's got to be like a good like Southern saying about this, right? Like there's got to be something that like, you know, might be a little more of our speed than like the way the Bible talks about this. I love good Southern sayings. I don't know if this is one that your parents or grandparents or you have said before, uh, but my grandfather used to always say, still says, um, I'd be like, all right, he and, you know, at Thanksgiving, be like, oh, Lord willing, and if the creek don't rise, I'm like, yeah, I guess so, true, Pop. Yeah, I mean, fair enough, right? Or I love that dog will hunt, or the alternate, that dog won't hunt, right? Like, it's like, yeah, I love that. Like, true, it won't. Like, it's so good. I love that, right? I love good Southern shanks. There's a country song um, that, I've, that I've thought about when preparing for this. It's by an artist named Christian Bush, and she says, I've never seen a hearse with a trailer hitch. That's a line. I love that, all right? That's a good word. I can pray right now and we're done, all right? Like, that'll preach. That's true, though, right? And, like, I was like, I know some southern girl somewhere has thought of a funny way to say this. It's the same principle we're talking about this morning. Never been a hearse with a trailer hitch. You cannot take it with you when you go. And see, I think oftentimes, even as Christians... We can fall into our cultural norm, our cultural idea that your life is about what you consume. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. The person who's ahead in life, who has the best, who's doing the best, that's the person with the most, the biggest house, the nicest car, the most money in their bank account. That's not the way of Jesus. That's not what God says is true about you and me. That is not what the kingdom of God is like. Instead... God has given us an opportunity not to waste our lives by investing it in the things of this world, but to make our lives count by investing it in all of eternity. 
See, I think we all know this is true. If a country song isn't proof, even people who aren't Christians know that they're not taking everything with them when, they're go, when they go. Even people who aren't followers of Jesus know that the things they're consuming, purchasing, buying, gathering for themselves, they know they're temporary. You know they're temporary. But the world's response to that is, well, I better live it up then. If those things are temporary, then I better do everything I can to get everything I can out of it. The Christian response to that is to say, I know these things are temporary, so I'm not going to give my life to them. I know these things are temporary, so I'm not going to invest everything I have in them because they're here today and gone tomorrow. The way that Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6 is incredibly familiar. I, you probably know what passage I'm talking about. Jesus talks about storing up our treasure. He says we have a choice. We can either store up our treasure in heaven or we can store up our treasure on earth. Look with me at Matthew 6, 19. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but instead lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, don't invest in this world. You know it's temporary. Think about it this way. Jesus says that's a bad investment. Think about your 401k. Think about the stock market. He says that is a bad investment. You know it's going down. You know it's temporary. You know it's depreciating in value. You know it will not last forever. Why would you invest everything in that? That's a bad investment. He says instead give everything to that which will last forever. Give everything to that which you know you can spend eternity enjoying. You will not spend eternity enjoying your house. You will not spend eternity enjoying your retirement fund. You will not spend eternity enjoying whatever car or boat or lake house or vacation you went on, whatever you spent your money on. You will not spend eternity enjoying it, but you will spend eternity enjoying God knowing him, living in relationship with him, having joy in him for all of eternity. And you can invest in that right now. You don't have to wait to the end of your life to invest in the eternal kingdom of God. You can begin right now. I think oftentimes the life for us as Christians is not that our possessions and our money will make us happy. I think most of the people in this room, if you follow after Jesus, you would say, I know my possessions won't make me happy. I know that I won't be satisfied in my money or in my savings account or in my lake house. I know those things won't satisfy me. I think instead, most of the time for Christians, we believe the lie that those things will make us secure. Maybe not that they'll make us happy, but that those things will make us secure. That if I have enough money in my savings account, then I don't have to worry about anything. That if, I, if, I have an, if I've gathered enough for myself, then when a rainy day comes, then I'll be okay. Then everything will be all right. Money is not something you can place all of your security in. And also in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would say something like, that is shifting sand. That's a poor foundation for your life. Because when the storm comes through, money will not be enough to hold your life up. Just like Ecclesiastes said, sometimes you get involved in a bad venture. You, won't, you don't know for sure it is going to be there tomorrow. No matter how much you accumulate for yourself, it will never be enough to give you the kind of security that God wants to give you in your life. You can instead build your life on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. And you can know that no matter what happens to your money, no matter what happens to your possession, no matter how bad the stock market gets, no matter how, how down the economy turns, no matter how difficult things get for you, you can know that you have a solid foundation for your life that won't change with the economic winds, that won't change just because the stock market went down. You can build your life on something more secure than that. So if it's true that our money won't satisfy us, and if it's true that our possessions and our money are temporary, and if it's true that investing in that life, in this life, is a bad investment, then what do we do? H how do we live in light of that? Our final truth, I think, tries to answer that question, and it's this. You can either use your money or your money will use you. You can respond in one of two ways. 
You can either learn to steward and manage your things, your money, your possessions, your treasure well, or it will consume you, or it'll use you up. Let's see where that is in scripture. Ecclesiastes 5, let's pick back up in verse 18. It says, behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possession and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. He says, the gift of God is to be able to accept what you've been given. Verse 20. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy in his heart. You have to make a choice. Will you decide to follow God's way when it comes to your treasure, your money, your possessions? Or will you allow those things to consume you? Will you allow those things to use you? Money, possessions, treasure, they're meant to be a means by which we would glorify our ultimate end, Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, what most people in America, what most people in our Western culture, what they live their lives as, is as if money and accumulation and gathering and possession, that those things were an end unto themselves. We live as if money is our ultimate end that wealth is our ultimate end, and that it's worth any cost, any means to attain it. And God says, rather, the key is contentment. The key is being good with what we have, being okay with whatever I have, and trusting that God's gonna give me what I need so that I can use those things as a means to the ultimate end of glorifying God. And this is exactly what Ecclesiastes says in verse 19. That contentment is the key. Being good with your lot is the way that Ecclesiastes says it. Just simply with what you've been given, the things that you have. You may say, what, it, what does contentment look like in my life practically? I think it looks like this. Contentment looks like open-handedness to God. We said at the beginning, it's not wrong to, to have a house. It's not wrong to have wealth. It's not wrong to save for yourself. It's not, it's not wrong to have money. It's wrong to hold so tightly to those things that God can't have anything to do with it. It's wrong to grip so tightly to those things that they become the thing we give our heart away to. And so what contentment looks like is saying, you know what, I'm good, I'm joyful, I'm content with the things that God has given me, but I'm gonna hold them open-handed to him so that whatever he wants to do with them, he can do. If God wants to take it all tomorrow, I'll just say exactly what Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Whatever God wants to do with my money, my answer is yes. You want me to invest it all? I'm in. You want me to give it all away? I'll do it. That's what he asked of the rich young ruler. It wouldn't be out of his character. He's done it before. God, if you want to take everything, it's up to you because I trust you more than I trust my money. That's what contentment says. It says, God, I trust you more than I trust my possessions. I trust you more than the security that I think my treasure can give me. I trust you more. That's what contentment has to say. And so the key to living the way that God has called us to when it comes to our money, when it comes to our treasure, our possessions, is learning contentment. To trust God with what we have and to find joy there. I, I love how verse 20 ends. It says, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Ecclesiastes says, you know what? There's a way that at the end of your life, you'll look back and say, you know what? I didn't even miss out. Yeah, I, I, I could have had a nicer vacation. I, I could have been in a nicer house. I, I could have drove a, a faster car. I, we could have had a few more weekends on the lake, but you know what? My heart was occupied with joy. My heart was full of satisfaction and joy that a boat could never give me. My, my heart was full of satisfaction and joy that no amount of money, no amount of false security, no amount of luxury could have ever provided for me anyway. And so he says, you will not much remember the, day of your, the days of your life. He says, at the end of your life, you don't have to be occupied with what you missed out on, but instead you'll look back and say, no, my heart was occupied with a greater joy than those things could have ever given me. 
as we close this morning, I, I just want to ask you a few questions of application. If you're taking notes, maybe you want to take these questions down and just consider them in your own time. Maybe you need to close your eyes and just ask God, will you help me to answer these questions well? But I just want to ask a few questions of application, and then we'll be done. First, how do you use your possessions? All of us have possessions. You have a house you, you own, you have cars you own, you have things that fill your, your home, your storage units. How do you use them? Is your house, for example, something that's used for God's glory? Do you invite the people in your neighborhood who don't know Jesus over for dinner so that you can use your home for God's glory? Do you open your home to be used for God's kingdom in whatever way he's calling you to? Or have you been turned inward and using your possessions only for that which can satisfy and fulfill you in your own life. Could, how do you use your possessions? Consider the individual things that make up your life. Do you use them for God's glory? Are you trying to figure out ways you can leverage those things as a means to the ultimate end of glorifying God? Secondly, what's your motivation when you purchase? When, when you buy things, when you spend money, what's your motivation? It's not to say that you can't buy things that you enjoy. Of course you can. But have you thought about any of those things helping you to know and enjoy Jesus better? Or are they things that actually make it harder for you to know and enjoy Jesus? It's not worth investing your money in something like that. Not it's not worth investing your treasure in things that actually pull you away from the only source of joy. So consider when you purchase, what's my motivation? Am I considering my walk with Jesus at all when I purchase. Then lastly, are you generous with your money to the point that it's sacrificial? Open-handedness with our money and our possessions. Because you know what? I know that my greatest investment is the kingdom of God, so I'm going to be generous to the point that it's difficult. I'm going to be generous to the point where it inconveniences me. I'm going to be generous to the point that there are some things I would like to buy that I won't be able to because they're not as important as the investment I can make into God's kingdom. And maybe that does look like giving to the church. I, this is, I believe God's people is how he wants to see his kingdom furthered here in the upstate across the world. I believe that. But there are also opportunities that you have outside of your regular tithes and offerings through this church and through other ways, through other ministries, where you can say, how can I be generous with what God has given me? Who are some people that you can bless? What are some areas in your life that you can invest deeply, sacrificially to the point where it's uncomfortable so that God would get the glory through what you have? My heart and my prayer is that during this time of worship, as we pray, if we just spend some time doing business with God, that we would live our lives open-handed to him. We would say, God, would you give us a contentment, a holy contentment, an open-handedness with what we have so that he can use what he's given us for his glory. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you really are better. Jesus, that you're the thing worth investing in. You're the pearl of great price. God, you're the, you're the field worth buying worth worth selling everything to have god that knowing you living in relationship with you god it's worth every sacrifice god help us to not be content with a lesser joy don't let us believe the lie that our possessions and our money can satisfy us. you alone can satisfy our hearts god for the person in this room who's been looking to other things but they want to find their satisfaction in you maybe even for the first time today god give them the boldness to step out and to do it to say yes to you god for those of us who just need to think we need to be intentional we need to consider the way you want to use what we have for your glory god help us to be open and willing and confident that you'll take care of us you'll provide us with the security that we need and god that you want to use what we have god use us use our treasure use our time, use our talent for your glory, we pray in your name. Amen.